Darcy Jr. spoke a bit of, about knowledge in his introduction of me. You know, the, the fact is, is knowledge is not all that it's cracked up to be. In fact, it's obvious that knowledge can be grossly overrated. Mark Twain once quipped, I've known many a soul educated to the point of total uselessness. Samuel Johnson once asserted, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. It only hastens fools to rush in where angels fear to tread. Or as the Apostle Paul asserted, knowledge puffeth up. After all, knowledge can be transferred, facts can be memorized, curricula can be mastered, information can be gathered, disciplines can be learned, skills uh, can be gained, data can be cataloged, but traditional education techniques can only go so far. Truth and wisdom are not nearly so easily obtained. For decades now, our educational systems have emphasized gaining knowledge. We want our children to have knowledge of the world, that we want them to have knowledge of the basic academic categories, and perhaps most importantly, well, we want them to have the knowledge of skills necessary for the job market. Ours is an information age, after all. I've already had somebody this afternoon showing off their new iPhone 4S. So communicating information or knowledge has been our primary aim and objective. We have assumed that if our children have a good grasp of the knowledge that they need, they'll be able to make their way in the world. As renowned Catholic educator Leo Brennan has rightly observed, we Americans are enthusiasts for education. We demand good teachers, we demand good textbooks, that we demand the best and the snazziest and the latest of everything that education has to offer. Thus, we have spared no expense or effort in order to pour knowledge into the minds and the lives of the next generation. Ours is one of the most extensive and expensive educational systems that the world has ever seen. Spending in inflation-adjusted dollars that has increased some 400% per pupil in the last 25 years. Teacher salaries have more than doubled, and the per capita number of support personnel has more than quadrupled. Education has, in fact, become the second largest industry in the nation, spending more than a quarter of a trillion dollars every year with nearly three million teachers and administrators. And if you listen to the debates currently raging in the educational and political spheres, you'll know that uh, school reform issues top the list of concerns of taxpayers and politicians and uh, public officials and have through virtually every one of the last 10 election cycles. And what do we have to show for all of this? With all of our emphasis on knowledge, it is the height of irony that we seem to know so little about everything. Now, we're swimming in an ocean of the 24-7, 365 information, or, or perhaps more accurately, we're drowning beneath its waves and swells. Education in this country is by any measure a dismal failure. Johnny can't read and Susie can't spell, Willie can't write, and Alice can't add. Teacher competency is down, administrative effectiveness and efficiency is down, student advancement is down, test scores is, are down. In fact, everything is down except the cost and the dismay. 
According to one study, as many as 90 million adults in this country are functionally illiterate. An additional 35 million are illiterate, meaning that they can read a, a few basics with difficulty, but that's about all. SAT score comparisons reveal an unbroken decline from 1963 to the present, despite the fact that standards have actually been lowered five times. Verbal scores, on average, have fallen over 50 points. Mathematics scores have dropped uh, nearly 70 points. A decade ago, one study of the 158 member nations of the United Nations showed that the United States ranked 49th in basic literacy levels. Another study revealed that nearly 40% of all American high school seniors could not draw inferences from written material. Only one-fifth could write a persuasive essay, and less than one-third could uh, solve an arithmetic problem with multiple steps. 25 million high school graduates three years ago it could not correctly identify the United States on an outline map of the world. 44 million were unable to find the Pacific Ocean, including 3 million in California. <laughs> Some 61 million were unable to come within 500 miles of locating the nation's capital, which actually may not be such a bad thing. If you think that I'm making all of this up, all you have to do is watch Leno's Man in the Street interviews. The shocking conclusion of another study was that nearly half of all Americans are so poorly educated they can't perform such relatively simple tasks as calculating the price difference between two items at the grocery store or filling out a job application at a fast food restaurant. The sad reality is that most Americans are so poorly educated, they don't even know that they're poorly educated. According to former Education Secretary Richard Riley, such data paints a picture of a society in which the vast majority of Americans do not know that they do not have the skills to earn a living in our increasingly technological society and international marketplace. We spent the money, established the commission, surveyed the problem, initiated reforms, rewritten the curricula, hired the experts, overhauled the entire educational system, and yet nearly 45% of all of the products of that system cannot even read the front page of Mick newspapers like USA Today. How could this possibly have happened? We live in the information age. Why is so little information getting through? We're intent on imparting knowledge. Why do we know so little? Part of the reason it may well be that we simply forgot that education is more than simply the transfer of knowledge. However important knowledge may be, true education involves something more. As the great Victorian pastor and social reformer Charles Haddon Spurgeon once wrote, I would have everybody able to read, write, and cipher. Indeed, I think that a man can't know too much. But mark you, the knowing of these things is not education. And there are millions of your reading and writing folk who are as ignorant as neighbor Norton's calf. Those ignorant masses of whom Spurgeon speaks are not those who failed to finish their lessons. They're instead those who did finish or at least those who thought naively that lessons were the sorts of things that could be finished. Fact is, as 
education doesn't have a terminus, a polar extreme, a, a finish line, an outcome. Instead, it is a deposit, an endowment, a promise, even a small taste of the future. All talk of education for us ought to be a reminder that we've only just begun to learn how to learn. It's an affirmation that though our magnificent heritage has introduced us to the splendid wonders of literature and art and music and history and science and ideas in the past, we've only just been introduced and that a lifetime adventure in these vast and portentous arenas still awaits us. Indeed, the most valuable lessons that education can convey are invariably the lessons that never end. But I'm convinced that even that is not the heart of the problem. Though methodologically and in terms of our orientation, it is a huge part of the problem. We have social reformers out there, including the well-meaning Christian social reformers, pursuing new agendas of accelerated academics and uh, critical thinking skills and a return to the classics. We have fourth graders reading Plutarch uh, to Plato and the uh, sixth graders reading Shakespeare to Solzhenitsyn. We've got Latin for etymology and Euclid for geometry, and still, we're as ignorant as neighbor Norton's calf. I'm convinced that what we need to propose is not so much a Tertullian-like advocacy of a great divide between Jerusalem and Athens, but as the Apostle Paul that demonstrated on Mars Hill, there are some questions that Athens will never be able to answer. Indeed, they will always erect monuments declaring their inability to answer those questions. I love the great books. I love reading Shakespeare and Milton and Chaucer and the Sir Walter Scott. I, I revel at the opportunity to take a, a, a young man and to sit him down and uh, lisp over the verses. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The, the road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The fact is, is that those are wondrous things, but the great books program inevitably will fall short if we do not have in our lives a great book program. The Word of God is His revelation of Himself, of His wisdom knowledge, understanding, and truth. God's Word reveals His decrees, His providence, His eternal purposes, His holy will, His sovereign intent. It is God's direction. It is His guideline, His plumb line. It is His bottom line. And when God speaks, His Word stands firm forever. His assessments of right or wrong do not change uh, from age to age, or hour to hour, or moment to moment, or culture to culture. Now, all His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. God's Word is truth, John 17 says. It is sacred, 2 Timothy 3 says. It is holy, Romans 1 says. Indeed, in the Scriptures, we have the very oracles of God, Hebrews chapter 5 says, the very breath of God, 2 Timothy 3 says. God's Word is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens, Psalm 119 says. It is true. It is good. It is forever right. It is the standard for all 
judgment. It is the word of life. Now, how are we going to understand Shakespeare and Chaucer if we've not yet plumbed the riches and the depths, if we've not explored the treasure house of God's own revelation, the, the lens, as Calvin put it, that enables our purblind eyes to see the world aright. We can have great books programs all day long, and all we do is affirm that Mark Twain, Samuel Johnson, and the Apostle Paul are right. Jesus said that Scripture cannot be broken. Indeed, not even the smallest letter could pass away. A man, uh, therefore, Jesus said, I shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And God's Word is sufficient to bring all things into focus. I love the fact that Thomas Chalmers, when he finally came to grips with the enormity of his youthful errors, he said that as a mathematician, the science of magnitude, he had weighed well temporal things, but had somehow forgotten the great height and breadth and depth of eternity until the Word of God opened his eyes, thus making him a better mathematician. All Scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Uh, The grass withers, the, the flower fades, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Indeed, heaven and earth will pass away, but His Word will not pass away. We know all of these things, at least we affirm that we do. So how do we account even in the best of our churches for the incredible amount of biblical illiteracy that we find everywhere evident today. Remember the the old TV show of Art Linkletter? Kids will say the funniest things. It was uh, reprised by, by Bill Cosby a few years ago. I oftentimes have mimicked that with a a little parlor trick that I use at youth camps and with youth groups. Try and get the kids to demonstrate how little they actually know about the Bible. And this, uh, several years ago, I had this shtick down pat. It was in the days of, uh, of the height of of the fame of uh, Jerry Seinfeld and uh, the crew from the Central Perk on Friends. Th- this is how the shtick went. I would stand in front of the youth group and I would say, okay, here's, here's a little quiz. I want to see h- how quick you are with the answers. Who's the character in Seinfeld with the funny hair? <sighs> Instantly there would be answers, a chorus, almost universal reply. It's Kramer, of course. What time does Friends come on? Again, absolutely no hesitation. Eight o'clock, Thursday nights, NBC offered one young lady nailing the coordinates in both space and time. (laughs) Complete this line from Spider-Man, I would say. With great power comes… It was like this glorious medieval antiphon. Great responsibility, some 75 voices cried in unison. 
Now, can someone tell me the difference between rap and hip-hop or emo and goth? Be a brief silence as they'd look to one another and cast about for a few answers and uh, perhaps to find the best spokesman to address the nuances of the question, but after a few initial observations were made, uh, the response became lively and demonstrative and democratic. Person after person shared either their thoughts or the distinctions and even provided a few good examples for me and suggestions of where to find them on iTunes. Okay, now let's change this just a bit, I would say. Who was the prophet in the Old Testament who had no hair? Silence. On what day did the Lord Jesus die on the cross? Emboldened by a narrow range of possible answers, a few hands went up and a few, a few possibilities were thrown out, all of them wrong. Complete this line from Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and obey Him, the NBC girl hopefully replied. Sorry, although obeying Him is a really good idea, it's not quite what I was looking for. Okay, somebody explain to me the difference between justification and sanctification. Not only was there silence, I started to roll back in their heads. The words of the poet Yeats, surely no friend of moral clarity himself, are too sadly being fulfilled before our very eyes in our very churches. But we had fed the heart on fantasies and the hearts grown brutal from the fair. Of course, it's not as if any of this catches uh, the Lord God uh, by surprise. In the Old Testament, the, the Lord again and again warned His people that they uh, must be vigilant in adhering to the Word of God. There's the lodestone for life. Again and again, He warned them to to tune out the voices of the world and to hear His voice clearly. In the great Shema passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, the Lord uh, provides us with a glimpse of what covenantal succession ought to look like. He declares here a, a comprehensive plan for discipleship, uh, dare I say it, for education. Indeed, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is, in a sense, the constitution, the, the foundation, the, the model, the paradigm for, for uh, godly education ever since. Uh, the, the great flowering of Western civilization in art, music, literature, and ideas, the, 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 the building of the glorious uh, monuments of faithful architecture the, across the boards to the cantatas of Bach uh, point us to, to this model. And what a unique model it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hands and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then we come to this remarkable discursus 
this narrative. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear, and you shall serve Him. Verse 14, you shall not go after other gods. Verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, Verse 17, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Uh, Verse 18, you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. And then in verse 20, we have this, uh, this, this beautiful frame to close the whole narrative. Now, in times to come, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of these testimonies and statutes and commandments that the Lord our God has commanded, then you shall say to your son, don't you love this? Son, it's story time. We were once slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out with a mighty hand. He showed signs, and He showed wonders. Verse 23, brought us out from there. Verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to do all of these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as we are to this day. Do you see the comprehensiveness of this great book program? This plan for covenantal succession, it is rich and resplendent, and it, and it touches on, on every aspect of life. It makes you almost want to shout Kuiper's a famous dictum, there is not one square inch over the whole realm of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, mine. Do you see what what dimensions this great book program takes? It starts with a, a kind of theological bent. All education, all discipleship is necessarily theological at its root. That's in verses 4 and 5. The, the, the whole program begins with this declaration, you shall love the Lord your God with heart and soul and strength. You can't know anything, not Shakespeare, not Chaucer, not trigonometry, not nuclear physics, if you do not know that there is one sovereign God who spoke the worlds into existence, who flung the stars into their places and sets the course of our lives. He can't know anything if you do not know this. So we buy the fancy curriculum and we have homework until 10 and up again at 6 to cram before Uh, the next test, and there's never an opportunity to open the Word of Truth. Great books programs are wonderful, but they're no replacement for the great book program. Notice, uh, the great book program is necessarily literary at its heart, Uh, for uh, these words shall be on the hearts of your children, verse 6. These words that I command you today shall be on the hearts of your children. It's a, it's a, a normal aspect of Western civilization uh, that we have a, a bent toward the literary, the, the benchmark of 
a true education is the ability to process information through reading. Uh, but here, uh, the Lord uh, makes it plain that the place that the reading needs to start, the, the place where words come alive, uh, the place where those words actually give life, is in the Word of God. No, notice that there is also a, a didactic bias to this uh, Shema form of education. The, the The revelation here makes it plain in verse 7 that teaching has to go on, even diligent teaching. The the Hebrew indicates that this will be laborious. It's hard work. How many people do you know who are outside of professional ministry who actually work hard in the Word? Are we teaching our people to work hard in the words, to to labor? Uh, Do do we exhort our pastors to teach diligently, our fathers, our moms? This is the heart of the great book program. There's also a, a covenantal bias. Notice the relational aspect here. These, uh, these commands that are to be on the hearts of our children, that are to be taught diligently, they're to be discussed all the time. When we sit, when we walk, when we lie, when we rise. The great book program is, is not simply a class that, that we tack on in period three. The great book program is to infiltrate and ultimately subsume every other discussion in every other discipline. There's an aesthetic bias to the great book program. Notice uh, verses 8 and 9, that the Word of God is not only to be in our hearts, it's to adorn our lives, our hands, our eyes, our doorposts, our homes, our gates. The, the picture here is that, that the Word of God is not superfluous, and it's not just a matter of the heart. It's a matter that governs the whole of life. It's to infiltrate everything and be everywhere evident in the believer's walk and in the believer's life. There is a, likewise an ethical bias <clears throat> in verses nine, uh, 10 through 19 that we see the exhortation that that these things are not just theoretical, philosophical. Uh, We're we're not teaching our children moral philosophy. Instead, we're to keep the commands. We're to do what is right, what is good, what what is true. As C.S. Lewis says, we're to practice the faith, even when it feels like the faith is rather remote. For in the practice comes the faithfulness. There is a historical bias uh, to this great uh, book program. Here in verses 20 through 25, uh, we see that that the meaning of all of uh, these commands comes alive when we begin to tell the story of God's good providence in our midst. This is really what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we get to that uh, that, uh, wondrous plaque verse, you know, the kind of verse that you see on plaques in Christian bookstores, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, there's no temptation that has overtaken you, but such is this common to man, and God is faithful. He will not tempt you beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to stand up under it. That that verse comes at at the end of a long discussion about how we're to read the examples that God has set for us in history. With the lens of the Word of God, we look with a backward glance across all of time, and we can see the hand of His providence. That is the way that the past 
becomes a means to direct us in the present for the trajectory of the future and walking in the ways of the Lord. This is the great book program. A lot of Americans are looking to politicians to solve our educational mess. How misguided is that? Many other Americans are looking to professional educators to solve the educational mess that America finds itself in. I've had the opportunity to be a part of a number of Christian schools at multiple different levels in in several different cultures. And one of the things that I always tell our administrators is, if somebody has an educational background, be suspicious. It's kind of like what uh, G.K. Chesterton said about experts. Experts are expert at destroying everything that they are supposed to be expert in preserving. The fact is, is that America's great educational crisis begins as God's faithful people in churches and in homes recover a love of the glory of the Word of God and its sufficiency to inform us in the whole of life. But we not only need to have dynamic preaching from the pulpits of America, But we need to have the kinds of practical exhortations for moms and dads to undertake the great book program in their homes. We need to encourage it at every turn. We need to be the people of the book again. And then, then we can begin to revel in the wonders of the treasury of our legacy passed on to us by our forebears in Western civilization. Then art and music and literature will begin to make sense and will open to us great wonders that we had never imagined before. I, as a child, learned that old Celtic war chant. I love so much from King Alfred, when the enemy comes in, roaring like a flood, coveting the kingdom and hungering for blood, the Lord will raise a standard up and lead his people on. The Lord of hosts will go before, defeating every foe, defeating every foe. For the Lord is our defense, Yesu defend us. For the Lord is our defense, Yesu defend. Some trust in chariots and some trust in the horse, but we will depend upon the name of Christ our Lord. The Lord has made my hands to war, my fingers to fight. The Lord lays low our enemies, but He raises us upright. He raises us upright. For the Lord is our defense. Yesu defend us. For the Lord is our defense. Yesu defend. A thousand fall on our left hand, ten thousand to the right, and yet He will defend us from the arrow in the night protect us from the terrors of the teeth of the devourer. Imbue us with your spirit, Lord. Encompass us with power. Encompass us with power. For the Lord is our defense. Yesu, defend us. For the Lord is our defense. Yesu, defend. I loved that as a child. I grew up at a essentially non-Christian home. I had no context for it. I I just loved its lilt, and I I loved the rhythmical nature of it. I I, I loved the way it got this old Celtic blood coursing. I didn't understand it. I, I didn't know that it was derived directly from Psalm 91 and Psalm 92. I knew the story of how it was used at the Battle of King's Mountain. Now, Now, old Sam Houston, the grandfather of the future president of the Republic of Texas, was saying it at the top of his lungs as he surprised the redcoats as they were marching through the uh, woods and the hinterlands between North Carolina and Tennessee. 
Now, I knew the story of how King Alfred had used it to inspire his men when he was but a 16-year-old book sniff and not supposed to inherit the crown at all, but wandering among his troops, his father and his brothers, now gone, swept away by the Norse invasion, was somehow stirred their hearts to face foes that no one believed that they could face and prevail. I knew those stories, but I didn't understand it. Because I'd never read the great book that shines a light in every lilt and every song, that, that, that makes evident every truth and that brings life to every hope and aspiration. I didn't yet have the lens of the gospel. And so, it was just words. Just words. At this moment of crisis in our culture, it's not who's the next president that will ultimately matter. It's who's teaching your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It's who's gathering all of the, the children of the Lord around them and saying, boys and girls, let me tell you a story. Once, once we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. But with signs and wonders, he set us free. And he gave us these commandments and statutes and laws that we might be preserved as we are to this day. May God be pleased to stir our hearts and our lives and our minds to initiate a comprehensive, great book program in our homes, our churches, our schools, our culture. And may God be pleased to use the likes of us in his great plan for this moment. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the great declaration of the Shema, the strategy that emerges for us to walk in the fullness of your kindness and goodness by revealing to us your word. Open our eyes, O oh Lord. Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.